Good evening, uh, brothers and sisters in Africa. It is my joy to spend this semester with you, studying the Word of God, and thank you for being faithful. You know, uh, faithfulness is really the character of God. And the children of God, uh, like yourself and I, we learn to be faithful. And thank you for just being consistent and being faithful uh, to the studying of the Word of God. Okay, and we are in week four, and we are continuing our study of First uh, Peter. So if you could just open your Bible, I would like to read the Bible first. First Peter chapter one. Starting from verse three, I'm going to read and I'm going to go uh, try to go as much as I can uh, try to finish the finish the first chapter. First Peter, <laughs> chapter one, verse three. First Peter, chapter one, verse three. That's it. Okay. First Peter chapter one, verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, uh, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Through you have not, uh, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you have, you did not see him, you believe in him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, salvation of your souls. And this is the word of God. Uh, last three weeks, we've been talking about uh, the background of First Peter. First Peter was written to Christians who are scattered throughout the Roman Empire who was uh, who are going undergoing a major persecution from the government itself the whole roman government and uh and and the emperor of the government was persecuting christians so first peter uh is written by peter probably after 30 40 years after jesus's resurrection could you try to picture that Jesus' ministry is done, and Jesus was resurrected and ascended to heaven, and the Holy Spirit came 40 days later, and uh, it's been about 30 years of Christian history. And Christians were exploding throughout the empire. Now, after 30 years, Christians were all over the Roman Empire, including Africa, like Egypt and uh, Northern Africa, as well as Greece, as well as Turkey, Asia Minor, and all over, even all the way to Rome. Okay, now there's a persecution. So what's the word that brings encouragement and that brings hope to these persecuted Christians? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember, we talked about uh, last two weeks, Peter burst out in praise because when one's mind is apprehended about great truth of God, 
you burst into praise. You burst into honor and praise. And what are those five things? We talked about his great mercy, number one. Great mercy. I need you to remember this and continue to preach. Christianity is about mercy of God. Great mercy of God. Secondly, it was he caused us to be born again. Born again Christianity. Regeneration. A new person. New heart. Okay. And then resurrection of Jesus Christ. Number three. The great truth of the Bible is, uh, the gospel is, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And number four, it was the inheritance that is kept for us in heaven, which is undefiled uh, and imperishable and unfading. And the fifth great truth that Peter mentions is return of Christ or the revelation of Jesus Christ in the last time. Now, that's a big framework. If you have that kind of gospel, you could preach the truth. You could preach the truth. Okay. So, uh, I need you to uh, just keep meditating about that. Okay. So, today, we're following through with that kind of gospel truth. What follows? It's the great joy. Do you have joy in your soul? And students, I ask you, you should be joyful. Are you joyful in your soul? Are you deeply joyful and grateful that God has called you? Pastors in uh, Kiarandongo, I'm asking you this question. I need you to answer to, your, to yourself. When you wake up in the morning, are you rejoicing? Because of his great mercy upon your life, that he has called you to uh, his great calling of loving him and following him. If you're not joyful, I don't think the people who listen to your preaching or teaching will be joyful. Birunji, I need to see you joyful faces. Beautiful <clears throat> African joyful men and women. Shining. Shining. Uh, uh, shining the brightness of Jesus Christ. I know there are challenges in Africa. I know there are challenges in Kiarandongo. We have challenges in New York too. Absolutely do. It's a real jungle and fight and battle to live as a Christian, even in New York. Christians are not welcome in New York. Christians, in fact, America is no longer a Christian nation, period. 250 years ago, when this nation was found, it was by, it was by the Puritans and Christians. So it was, quote, an unquote, Christian nation. But it is no longer the case. Christianity has been pushed out from the government, school, and all the pub public sectors. Now Islam and Hinduism and all kinds, Buddhism, all kinds of religion and atheism, secularism is just pre, is dominant in, 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 this, uh, in the state of New York. Okay, brothers and sisters, there's a challenges, but what is the uh, message that Peter preached to uh, these Christians who are undergoing persecutions? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those five truths. Okay. And when those when those five truths uh is please sit down. When those five truths is really uh reigning in our heart, verse six, in this you rejoice. We need to go to the word. Trusting in the spirit and learning to rejoice as a Christian pastors. I'm looking at your faces and I've been going to Africa for 20 years. So I kind of understand Africans. But we pray for joy in your heart. Joy in your heart. Can we do that? Uh, Pastor Ara, 
Are yes. you rejoicing because of Christ? That's yes, beautiful, right I there, do. showing your teeth, white teeth. That's beautiful. Yes. That's beautiful. Brother next to you, what's your what's your name? Bosco. I'm called Bosco. Are you rejoicing? Yes, I'm rejoicing. Beautiful, right there, showing your teeth. Rejoicing <laughs> in this dark yeah. world to your congregation. <laughs> right? I'm going to ask yeah. and students, uh, Nathan, are you rejoicing in the Lord? Yes. Wonderful. We are rejoicing. No, no, I'm asking Nathan. I'm asking Nathan. Nathan, are you rejoicing? Amen. Amen. Birunji, let me see you rejoicing. Wonderful. Wonderful. Right? Doesn't God give you more energy? Like when you wake up in the morning, Lord has called me. I was such a self-centered, arrogant, and not listen to anybody, selfish human being. Mm -hmm. Heading for, heading toward destruction. Living in darkness. Living in reckless life. And God has called me into this marvelous light of Jesus Christ. By his great mercy. Okay? And he has caused me to be born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And there is an eternal salvation that is kept in heaven for me. And he is coming back. You should be rejoicing if you believe in that. And if you agree with me, uh, would everyone say Amina? Amen. Amina. So in this Amen. you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials and testings and what's the purpose of that verse 7 so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire now there is a uh, i was preaching uh through temptation of jesus christ in in our church right now because i'm preaching through matthew i'm planning to preach through matthew pastor ada uh, for two and a half years. <laughs> for two and a half years, I'm going to preach through Matthew. Every single week, I'm going to preach Matthew. And I'm up to uh, lecture number 10 right now. And I was preaching about temptation. Okay. The temptation, Jesus was tempted by the devil. And it was led by the Holy Spirit. Did you understand that? Unless God allows, you will not be tempted. If you remember the story of Job, you know, the Satan comes and he speaks to God about tempting uh, Job. And God allowed him to do it. Everything is in the hand of God and God allows for you to be tempted. So the different word is God tests his people. God disciplines his people. Why? What's the purpose of God? testing his people through various trials, tested the genuineness of your faith. You know what God is doing? God is purifying your faith. God is purifying your faith. You know why it needs to be purified? Because it is tainted and mixed with the world, selfishness, sinful desire, and our faith in God need to be purified. I don't know whether you know, when uh, goldsmith try to purify gold, gold, you heat up the fire, okay, and the gold melts in the furnace. Gold, piece of gold, if you heat up the fire in the furnace and the gold melts, and when gold melts, the dross, sit up, please. Everyone sit up, please. People, students and ants, would you sit up? Yeah, sit up, please. Yeah, please sit up. Yeah. I, I try yeah. to do my best. I don't want you to crouch and, and try to, you know, look tired. Come on. When you heat up the fire, when you heat up the fire, all the impurities 
It just kind of, it surfaces up. Okay? All the impurities. And you heat up more, you know what happens? All the impurities, it just evaporates. So what's left is pure gold. Pure gold. Christians, pastors, God test his people so that your faith will be, genuineness of your faith will be tested and purified. Isn't that wonderful? About 10 years ago, I was very, very sick. I was very, very depressed. I wanted to die. Can you imagine that? As a pastor, we had a very good uh, church, very good ministry going, but I was diagnosed with deep depression. And uh, I was, it almost felt like I'm sinking into darkness. And I isolated myself. I didn't want to see anybody. I, I could not read the Bible. I was sick, very, very sick. And all I thought about is for so long, more and more, God does not love me and I should die. Can you believe that? So I go to my basement and try to pray to the Lord and Lord speak to me about my sin. My sin, my sin. Basically, sin that he pointed out to me, it's not smoking, drinking, adultery, no, nothing like that. The sin he pointed out to me was this. You want to be sit on my throne. You love to be praised and glorified by people in your church, in your home, you love to be sit on my seat and receive the glory. And it was pointing out to me. And I was scared. I was really, really scared. So I said, Lord, I repent. Lord, I repent. Lord, I repent. But he said, no. He left me alone, even with repentance. And that went on. Three months, four months, six months. And I was just going down, 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 down. Until I thought, literally, I was the worst of sinners in the whole world. I was beyond anybody to save me. I was beyond my family to love me. I was just, I should be thrown on the street. Let me die and rot. Do you understand it? I went that far. I took medication. I was sick. And then Lord began to lift me up. You know what I have learned? Number one, yes, I am beyond salvation of anyone else. I don't deserve it at all. That's what I learned. And I know my sin nature always want to be God. Always want to sit on the throne of God. That's my sin nature. I truly repent. And I fear God. I fear God. Okay. And you know what? And also when I repent, you know, I try to repent and I try to pray and I feel like I need to, des uh, I, I deserve forgiveness of God. And God told me, no, I don't owe you the forgiveness. God does not owe you forgiveness. I am a great sinner, worst sinner. And even my family don't uh, doesn't have to love me. And certainly God doesn't have to love me. But he loves me. You know, testing of your faith is the grace of God to purify your faith. Otherwise, you know what you you know what you and I are gonna try to do? Always use God to glorify yourself. 
Always try to use God to glorify yourself. That's, that's what we do. Do you remember the story of Abraham in Genesis chapter 22? God asked for Isaac, whom Abraham probably loved more than anything in this world. And God told Abraham to give, a burn, uh, give Isaac as a burnt offering. And Abraham, to cut the story short in Genesis chapter 22, he went to the mountain of Moriah and he was ready to kill Isaac, trusting that even if he kills that he will raise him from the dead. Okay? So, and through that, what happened? When he was about to slay his son Isaac, God stopped him. Abraham, Abraham, stop. Stop. Abraham, stop. Now I know you fear me. Now I know you fear me. You know what the testing of God is? Genuine, uh, you know, what what God is doing through the testing and trials and difficulties and things like that, He wants you to trust Him and fear Him. Purify your faith. That's a wonderful thing. But amazing thing is, God help you realize He loves you, and He will never tempt you beyond what you can handle. Bible says. Mm -hmm. And when he tests you, he always provides a way out so that in the time of need, you will be able to receive his mercy and grace. You understand that? Salvation is to an undeserving, absolutely undeserving sinner like you and certainly me. And when he started the work, he's going to finish it. But in the meantime, what does he do? He tests your faith to purify your faith. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's a wonderful thing. Otherwise, you're always going to try to use God. Use your church for yourself. Use your status as a pastor for yourself. Use your you know, privilege that God has given you for yourself. And you know what? You're going you're gonna to ruin your life like that. If you have that kind of heart, you may serve the Lord all your life, but when you stand before the Lord, you'll be severely rebuked. May God purify your faith and my faith. And that's what uh, P Peter is saying to these Christians who are undergoing various trials and deaths losing their job, losing their family. What consolation, what comfort, what encouragement can anybody give to people like that? It is the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ, eternal salvation, and that he is coming back. That's the hope. That's what, 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 what Peter is talking about. Okay, so let me continue, all right? Verse 7, um, you are grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When you are purified, at the time of Christ's return, revelation of Jesus Christ, it's going to result in praise and glory and honor of Christ. Do you understand that? That's wonderful. And God will continue to discipline, test his children because we are his children. You have your children, and when you raise uh, your children, like... Uh, I, I forgot who has eight children. Somebody has eight children. Uh, <laughs> Pastor Ara, you have eight children? Seven. Seven. Okay. Okay. Only seven. All right. Seven. See, when your children, you love them. I know you love them. But yeah. do you only say good things to them? 
or do you sometimes rebuke them? Pastor Ada, do you yes. sometimes discipline them and rebuke them as a father? Yeah, sometimes. I have of course, to. right? You have to. <laughs> you have to. When your child yeah. lies, when child <laughs> hit other siblings, when they are disobedient, yeah. you need to rebuke them, correct them. Yeah. Even the human <laughs> fathers disciplines our children. Hebrews chapter 12 says, as best as we can, how much more Heavenly Father will discipline us so that we will partake in his holiness. In his holiness. Pastors, we should seek holiness. And it comes through the testing and discipline and trials. And God continues to purify us so that we trust him. And we long for him. We hope for him. Okay? Wonderful. Though you have not seen him, verse 8, you love him. you never seen him. Nobody saw Christ in, in physical sense. But you love him. Though you did not see him, you believe in him. You never saw him, but you believe in him. You rejoice with joy that is inexpressible, filled with glory. Wow. Christians, joy in your heart with the glory. With the glory. That's the kind of joy. So we're talking about supernatural gospel joy. You have never seen him, but you love him. How many of you love the Lord? Would you say Amina? Amen. And, and students, how come you're not answering? How many of you love the Lord? Would you say Amina? Amen. Amen. You've Amen. never Amen. seen him, but you love him, which means what? That's a miracle of God. That's supernatural grace. You have never see, seen him, but you believe in him. Man, Jesus is my hope. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. You believe. You have never seen him. How do you do that? That's the miracle of God. That's the supernatural grace of God. Christianity, salvation, is the work of God, supernatural work of God. Okay? So it is uh, the supernatural work of God with a joy that is inexpressible, filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. That's the path and life of salvation. I want to talk about salvation, okay? Starting from verse 10, I'm going to read up to 12, okay? Verse 10, chapter 1, verse 10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the suffering of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven Things into which angels long to look. Wow, such an amazing statement. Can we talk about the word salvation? Salvation is from God. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Bible says in, uh, in the Psalms, salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation is not human work. Salvation is not human achievement. Salvation is not something human earn. Salvation is a work of God. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Could you put that in your mind? Because if that's not clear to you, you will preach work-based Christianity. 
which is false Christianity. Salvation is completed through a completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross and the resurrection of Christ and him coming back. It's not human work. Okay. Salvation is such a big word from Genesis all the way to Revelation. From creation all the way to return of Christ and judgment of the living and the dead and eternity is about salvation message. Salvation. Okay? In other words, this, the main theme of the Bible is salvation. Okay? I would say from Genesis all the way to Revelation, there is one theme of God saving his people through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the theme of the entire Bible. What is Genesis about? Right? What is Exodus about? What is Numbers about? What is Deuteronomy is about? What is Samuel's is about? What about the prophets? What about the Gospels? What about the uh, the epistles, Pauline epistles, and Petrine epistles? What about Book of Revelation? Everything is about salvation Jesus. through Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And this salvation has been planned before the foundation of the world. Now, that's, that's an amazing truth. Okay? And students, let's be energetic. Okay, let's be energetic. Salvation of your life has been ordained before the creation. Thomas Ada. Yes. Pastor. Written in the book of life before the creation of the world. God thought of you and he has predestined for you to believe. Where is he going to be born? South Sudan. Okay. He's going to be born. What year? Sometime in two, uh, 1990 something, 19 something, 20th century. Birunji, written in the book of life. Okay, Birunji. Where is she going to be born? Uganda, Uganda, in Africa. Paul, Paul Chung. Where is he going to be born? In Korea, in 1962. It's an amazing. Salvation is God's planning, God's grace. We talked about great mercy. Why is it great mercy? Because God is so great, holy, and yeah. we are great sinners. And yet he thought of you, he thought of me, and he has called you out of 80 billion people. 8 billion people, excuse me. Can you, do you know how many people are truly regenerated, born again Christians in the world right now? I don't think it's that many. Honestly, I don't think it's that many. How many people go to church in Sudanese, uh, in Kiarandongo? I don't think it's major. It's, it's the majority. In New York, less and less and less people even go to church. Less and less and less church preach the truth and the gospel. Less and less and less people, even in gospel preaching church, truly believe born again, regenerated, walking in the spirit, believing what we are talking about, rejoicing and living for the glory of Christ. Less and less. And less. It's God's amazing grace. If you are truly regenerated Christian who love the Lord and who desire to love, uh, live for the Lord, you have been, you have been shown mercy, great mercy. Concerning this salvation. It's an amazing truth. From Genesis all the way to Revelation. Let me talk about the Bible. Bible is made up of how many books? 66 books. 39 books in the Old Testament. 
and 27 books in the New Testament written by 40 different authors, Moses, Samuel, okay? And like the prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, all these different authors. And then there are 27 books. It was written in the span of 1,500 years from Moses all the way to John. 1,500 years. Written by 40 different authors, put together by great sovereignty of God as a Bible, canon of the Bible. And there are many, many prophecies 600 years ago, 700 years ago from, from Isaiah, or 1,500 years ago by Moses about Jesus, about the Messiah. 300 prophecies fulfilled in one person of Jesus Christ. Can you think for a moment? That's an amazing miracle. That's an amazing miracle. And you put together, you know, books written by 40 different authors into one book, and then they make sense, and there is coherence. It's about Christ, everything pointing toward Christ, everything speaks about Christ, and how is that possible? It's the amazing hand of God and the plan of God. In other words, what I'm trying to say is one of the greatest evidence of Christianity and the gospel is the Bible itself. Bible itself. Do you follow? 40 different yeah. authors. Some of them are kings like David. Some of them are like farmers. Some of them are fishermen. Right? John was a fisherman. So fisherman, king, scholars, bombers, Ezra, Nehemiah, put together. It's one book of the Bible about Jesus and God saving uh, the people through the person of Jesus Christ. Salvation. Biggest theme in the Bible. Christian church, we preach the gospel of salvation. We preach the gospel of salvation, not prosperity. Hmm. Prosperity is garbage. It's satanic. Satanic. Because it distorts the truth. It deviates the heart. It rots our soul. It's a satanic gospel. It is about salvation through the uh, blood of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is alive and he's coming back. That's what the mm -hmm. gospel is concerning this salvation. Okay. Hebrews 9.27 says, all men are destined to die. And then there is a judgment. Pastors, you're going to have to stand before the judgment. Students at ends, wake up. You're going to stand before the judgment of God. Me too. Me too. Christian gospel, it is about judgment and salvation. Let me ask you, when we say we are saved, saved from what? Saved from what? In essence, it's from the judgment of God. Or from God. When we say we're, I'm saved. What does that mean? I mean, that means I'm going to heaven, and I, I, I don't go to hell forever. So, what are we talking about? We are saved from the judgment of God. So, we're talking about judgment and salvation. You cannot talk about salvation without talking about judgment. You understand that? You know, story of Noah. Noah. In Genesis chapter 6 through 8. Story of Noah is about. What is Noah story about? Birunji. What is story. What is the story of Noah about? What is the story of Noah about? What is the. What, what is that about? The story of Noah was about. 
Judgment. Exactly. Judgment yeah. through what? Through what? Through the floods. Through... Yes, absolutely. Yeah. How many people survived? Only the family of Noah. Only eight people, family of Noah, correct. Yeah. What about the rest, all the living things? They, they perished. They were destroyed. Okay, good. Do you see the judgment of God? God has warned people through prophet Noah that judgment is coming the rain is coming so you repent and get into the ark but people mm -hmm. would not listen God was preaching the gospel through Noah to the people but people weren't listening for 120 years they uh, Noah built an ark 120 years they saw the salvation they saw that we need to get in. Yes, rain is coming. We need to get into the ark if we are to live and to be saved. But they never got in. And they were taunting Noah. Where is the rain, you old man? You crazy old man. There is no rain. There is no judgment. There is no God. People say this day and age. But rain came. Rain came. What were people doing? Students, could you sit still? Oh, fine. You know, we're going to take a break. Our friend Michael, maybe he can tell you his problem. Yeah, try to sit still, please. Yeah, it is me, master. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm trying to... Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to... Raise godly men men here. You know, we need to learn to be faithful. All right. Sorry about that. So Noah was preaching the gospel, but people weren't listening. What were they doing? The Bible says they were eating, drinking, and getting into marriage. What does that mean? All the earthly things. Just like Sudanese, just like Ugandans, just like Rwandi, just like Americans, just like Koreans right now. People pay no attention to the truth, gospel, judgment, and salvation. People don't want to hear this. But the judgment came and, and people perished. Now, is story of Noah just about, is it just about uh, judgment? No, it is about the ark, salvation. Christian message is about judgment and salvation. Jesus' message about the cross is about, is about what? Judgment and salvation. What happened on the cross? What happened on the cross? Jesus died for your sin. And Jesus was judged. Judgment and the wrath of God came upon Jesus, which you and I need to get when we die. He took our judgment. In other words, there is only two places New Testament speaks about the judgment of God. The cross of Christ and the final judgment. Either you are judged on the cross with Christ, or you will be judged at the end when Christ returns. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Concerning salvation, we need to preach sin, judgment, and then perhaps you could preach the cross of Christ and salvation of Christ. Amina? Amen. Amen. I want to take a few questions before we take a break. Now we're going to take a break. So try to, let's let's sit still. Now we're going to take a break in a few minutes. So let's, let's take a couple of questions before we take a break. Does anybody have a question? Yes, there's a question here. Yes. Yeah, my question is about on the trial. 
Yes. Uh, I just want, um, my question is why God using the Satan in the time of our trial, not him to trial us direct. Mm -hmm. He's allowed Satan to test him. <laughs> yeah, okay. No, that's a good question, Pastor. Uh, God allows Satan to tempt other people, but never beyond what we can handle because we are his children. But if you look at Genesis chapter 22, God tested Abraham too. It was God who tested him. Mm -hmm. Right? And it's the purpose of now you fear me. So through that uh, Genesis chapter 22, probably Isaac was like someone more important than my own life to Abraham. Someone he loved and treasured. Can you imagine after 25 years, he was 100 years old when he had his, mm -hmm. his son. So Isaac was probably like 15, 16 years old by that time. So uh, Abraham was 115 years old, old man. And yet God asked him to give that child to me. Probably referring to something you treasure the most in this world. Doesn't Jesus say the same thing? Unless you love, if you love your mother and father more than me, you cannot serve in the kingdom of God. Does that mean we need to hate our mother and father? Of course not. But our commitment and love and devotion to the Lord has to exceed our love for our family and our parents and even our family, even myself. So yes, God tested Abraham directly or God tempted, uh, God allowed temptation through Satan uh, uh, and allow these trials so that our hearts may be purified for the genuineness of our faith. And you'll become stronger. You'll become much, much fearful of God and you build muscles. Okay? Brothers in... Uh, yeah. Brothers in Kirandongo, uh, we need to build our spiritual muscles because temptation comes all these trials come and in this world we will be persecuted blessed are the persecuted for the righteousness for they are the sons of god if you preach christ if you preach the truth the world will oh. hate you even the nat natural man in your church will hate you the reason is, by nature, human beings hate the truth and hate God. They want to rebel against God until the Spirit of God convict and change their heart. Okay, good question. Thank you. One more question, and we'll take, and then we'll take a break. Anybody from uh, Ants? Does anybody have a question? Mine is. Uh... Yes. The lesson that uh, I learned from the story of Noah. Yes. I wanted to share to our common understanding of today. Mm -hmm. Since Noah was told to build an ark and he, mm -hmm. he was uh, told to enter in the ark with his family, mm -hmm. to our understanding of today. Yeah. Does it mean when you bind yourself to Jesus, you are like Noah mm -hmm. who built an ark. Does it? Uh, probably I would interpret, I would not interpret that way, but uh, in the story of Noah, in the story of judgment and salvation, probably the ark refers to Christ. It's like a typology of who Jesus is. So you and I, Patrick, we always point toward Christ. Tell people to come to Christ. Come into Christ. And be saved. Believe in the Lord and you'll be saved. So I would go toward that direction. Does that make sense, Patrick? Yes. Yeah. All righty. Thank you. Let's take a five-minute break, Sharp, and we will meet back uh, for the second half. Okay, okay. five minutes.
But Pastor, I have one uh, question to ask. Sure. Before right. Go ahead. Uh, my concern was this letter of Peter. Mm -hmm. Did Peter write this letter to the scattered Christians or they were together when he attempted to write this letter? This letter was written to scattered Christians? Yes. Yes. Because it was the it was the days of persecution where the Christians scattered or they were in one yes. place. Yes. That is if what you, I, I yeah, that yeah, that's a good question. If you read uh first uh couple verses, this was written to those who are elect exiles of dispersion, which means they were scattered all over the Roman Empire. Probably because of the persecution, even the church gathering was difficult. So they were scattered all over the place. Can you imagine what kind of encouragement this letter was to those fearful Christians? So it was written uh, to the elect exiles of the dispersion, which means scattered all over Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, all over the empire. Okay. And they, how, how were they able to to get this letter since they were scattered? <laughs> Probably uh, there were people who are passing around, going from church to church, and and uh, written in uh, written and, and it was shared. They made copies and things like that. There are people going from one city to another and and given to the people. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's begin. So we're going to continue to talk about salvation, concerning this salvation. Verse 10, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. That's an amazing statement. Prophets are before Christ, people who prophesied about Messiah or Christ. So we're talking about Old Testament, Isaiah, okay, and, or, you know, Jeremiah, or all these prophets, they prophesied about grace. Isn't that amazing? Wait a minute. Isn't Old Testament about the law? Isn't Old Testament about God's, you know, like, direct rule? But prophets who prophesied about the grace what is that grace is peter referring to referring to christ actually they prophesied isaiah prophesied about grace jeremiah prophesied about grace zephaniah and all these prophets prophesied about grace that was to be yours Who's, who's yours? Those suffering Christians in 1 Peter that Peter is writing to. And they searched and inquired carefully. In other words, when Isaiah prophesied about Christ in Isaiah 53 or at different parts, do they just write down whatever the Lord placed in their heart? No. Peter saying they searched and inquired, examined carefully. Who did? Prophets did. Can you picture that? Isaiah didn't write, just didn't write uh, whatever Lord places in his heart and just start writing down. They searched and examined carefully. About what? Verse 11. Inquiring, examining what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the suffering of Christ and the subsequent glories. Wow. You know what he's saying? The prophets before Jesus came, they were examining and searching for the person and the time, indicating when he predicted the suffering of Christ and the subsequent glories. Old Testament speaks about suffering Christ. Old Testament speak about subsequent glory, which means resurrection. Did you know that? 
in the Old Testament, death, suffering of Jesus is predicted. Psalm 20. Okay. Isaiah 53. In other words, they already, in this plan of salvation, Jesus will come and he's going he's gonna to be a suffering servant. He's not a political, powerful kingdom ruler comes and, and save the people. But it's going to be a suffering servant. Even talked about uh, uh, the death of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 50, 53. He was despised for our transgressions. Do you remember that? And the Old Testament spoke about uh, and they predicted about subsequent glory, which means glory that follows. Death, suffering, and what follows? Resurrection, ascension, victory, vindication, vindication of sin and death and Satan and the kingdom. It's all written in the Old Testament through the prophets. Pretty amazing if you think about it. And how do they do it? If you look at verse 11, inquiring what person or time, meaning Who's uh who is uh, who is the Messiah? When is he coming? Where is he gonna come? Is it gonna be Bethlehem or is it gonna be the in, in the castle or kingdom of Jerusalem? Where was Jesus born? Small town of Bethlehem, right? So all these things were written, prophesied, and how was that done? <laughs> Amazingly, prophets uh through the Spirit of Christ. Do you see that in your Bible? Spirit of Christ in them was indicating the suffering of Christ and subsequent glories. Prophets had the Spirit of Christ in them. That's Holy Spirit. Let me ask you, could you think with me? If the prophets were writing down Old Testament Bible... Old Testament Bible, who is who is who is writing this down? Who is predicting that? Who is prophesying that? It's Christ Himself. Christ Himself is prophesying through the prophets, and Christ came. In other words, Christ, the Spirit of Christ himself was prophesying about himself. Pretty amazing if you could understand what's going on in the Bible. Do you follow what is what is what I'm explaining? Pastor Thomas, do you follow? Yes. No. This is an amazing verse. And the prophets, through searching and examining carefully, they knew about uh, the suffering of Christ, death of Christ cross of Christ and they knew about resurrection and uh, subsequent glories concerning salvation this is about salvation do you follow what's going on students and ends yeah. yes do you follow what's going on yes yeah this is a little difficult verse but if you pay attention I think you could you could understand it. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the suffering of Christ and the subsequent glories. Verse 12, it was revealed to them to the prophets, that they were serving not themselves, but you. Scripture, Old Testament is written, not really for the prophets, but for you. For you. Okay. Do you see that? They were not serving for themselves, but you. In the things you have now been announced to you, through those who preach the good news to you 
by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things into which angels long to live. You know who preached the gospel? It is by the Spirit, those, uh, those people who are by the Spirit sent from heaven. Do you preach the gospel? I hope you do. Do you preach religion? Do you preach work-based religion? Do you preach prosperity gospel? That's not from heaven. If you're preaching the good news, the gospel, to you, it is by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Okay? So what's the gospel? Something that Old Testament prophets, and they wrote about. They carefully searched and inquired about the person and when he's going to come is it going to be at bethlehem is it going to be is it going to be a victorious a, a a a soldier no he was a suffering servant and he will be despised and he will be crushed and he will be he'll be he'll be hated but he will be glorious and vindicated resurrected, ascended, and he's going to be the king of kings. That's written in the Old Testament. And the, basically, uh, it's for the salvation story. There's so much we could learn from the scripture, brothers and sisters. It takes lifetime and more to continue to learn the scripture. The more you study, the deeper and the greater the truth becomes in your soul. Okay. Uh, I'll take questions. Do you uh, do you have any questions? It was a little bit difficult passage, but if you go back and and look at it again, and and I know you'll be able to pick it up. Okay. Any questions? Mm. Yes, there's a question. Yes. Uh, it's me, Amule. Okay, Amule. Uh, okay. I'm asking you, you, you teach us about salvation. Yes. Uh, that salvation is that it was set before creation. Mm. How was it set? How was it what? Set. I don't understand the question. Could you rephrase the question so I can understand it? That salvation was from beginning. Mm -hmm. So how was it started? How was it started? Started. <laughs> it's the triune God in his full knowledge. And for God, there is no time limit, no space limit. He is present everywhere. He has no past, present, no future. But God, with his uh, omniscient knowledge, and he planned that human beings will sin and will rebel against God. But he loves people, and he, wants, he made a plan to save him through his son, Jesus Christ. Pretty interesting to, pretty amazing to think about it, right? To God, God is not human being. To us, 20 years ago is past. Now is present. I'm in uh, ants in Uganda. That's present. Maybe in 10 years, you will be in the mission field. There's past, present, and future. But to God, God is always present, past, present, future. There is no time limit. There is no space limit. And God so loved the world. He gave his only son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have our everlasting life. I was going to uh, share with this. Uh, in 1 Timothy 2.4, the Bible says, God desires all men to be saved. That's God's desire. Not everyone will be saved, but God 
desires all men to be saved. Is God good or is God bad? God is good. Do you desire all men to be saved? Pirunji. Yeah, thank you. Do you desire all men to be saved? And your answer is no. Of course not. We don't. You don't care about other people. You don't really, you don't even want American to be saved. Do you pray for that? I don't know whether you do. We human beings don't have that kind of desire inherently. God has to give to us. Do you desire people in your congregation to be born again and saved as pastors? I hope you do. Or do you want to be just be a pastor of a big church, successful pastor? Do you want a successful church or do you want Christians to be born again in your church? It could be two different things. To be born again. It could be two different things. When you stand before God, that will be clearly revealed. Do you want big buildings? Something that you could kind of like be proud about? Big program? Or do you want true followers of Christ in your, in your ministry? Yeah. You need to search your heart. God may purify your heart. Students at ANTS, you're thinking about ministry in the future. I don't know what your perception is of your life and what your ministry will look like. You understand it? God desires men to be saved. But I don't even think pastors desire that. I'm not saying you, you're not, but oftentimes our desire is our success in ministry. That's bad. That's terrible. God desires all men to be saved and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. In order for that to happen, you as a pastor, you need to preach Christ. You need to preach salvation through Jesus Christ. Salvation is by grace and grace alone. And Jesus is the grace incarnate by grace through faith in christ for good works if in your ministry uh pastors in south sudanese uh kiarandongo if you want to see your people come uh, uh to be saved you need to preach christ and desiring all men to be saved are they saved you should not baptize the Christians who are not saved. You should not. You should not. Because a baptism is external uh, external uh, manifestation of what, what is really happening in the inside. You really be, uh, you believe, I have been united with Christ. I believe in him. Then you baptize them. Okay. John 3.16. For God so loved the world. It's pretty amazing. The whole world hates him and rebel against him, curse at God, and yet God loves them and God desires them to be saved. Saved from what? Eternal judgment. Saved from his eternal righteous judgment. He wants to save them. Okay? Psalm 3, 8 says, salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the church you serve and I serve, brothers and sisters, is the ark. It's not the church, but it's the Christ. They need to come, hear the truth, so that they will come to Christ to be saved. Amina? Amen. Amen. If you preach false gospel, people who listen to you will be condemned because of you. If you preach false gospel, which are lies of the devil, people in your congregation will be condemned because of you. So 
Bible says there is only one way of salvation. John chapter 14, 6. How do we know the way? Right? Do you remember that? Uh, Thomas asked in John chapter 14. I preached last Sunday at our new church plant. And that message, and Jesus says, I am the way. I am the way. And the truth. And the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus is declaring that he's the only way. Jesus is declaring that I am the great I am. I am the uh, I am Yahweh and, and great Jehovah. Yes, his plan of salvation was uh, founded before the creation. Later on in the verse, you're going to see that full knowledge of Christ, even full knowledge of Christ. What does that mean? God's plan was saving his plan through Christ by people believing in him, trusting in him, having faith in him. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Um, Amato. Okay, hi, Amato. I have a question. Yes. Uh, I'm in doubt in the course of salvation mm -hmm. asking that uh, if someone is uh, born again yes and he backslided mm -hmm. to do things of the world mm -hmm. so is he still under salvation or he need to first come back then he will resume his salvation oh no he's gonna have uh, he's gonna have to come back you see, story of a uh, prodigal son. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, the younger son, he was a son. He was never mm -hmm. not son, but he went away from the father and he lived a very, uh, you know, sinful life. But by the spirit of God, he came to senses. He came back to the father. You see? Okay. So, People who look like Christian and they walk away and they, they live in the world and never come back. I don't think that's a good sign of salvation. One of the true evidence of salvation is they abide in Christ. Abiding in Christ. Remaining in Christ. Who are alive to God and who desire to live for him. And who wants to serve and obey him. That's the evidence of salvation. A person needs to repent and come back. Of course that could happen at the last moment of his life. You know we don't know. Of course we're not God. But the fact that he walked away. And living in the world. And not abiding in Christ. Not abiding uh, uh, you know, in, in, in Christ and for the kingdom. That's not a good sign. Is that, okay. Does that answer you, Amato? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, th you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Uh, good. Is there anything else I want to share? Uh, yeah, okay. Do you remember the story of uh, Jesus after he was raised and on the way to Emmaus, he, made two, he met two disciples? Do you remember that story? Students and ends. Do you remember that story? Do you know that story? You don't know? Okay. You need to read the Bible. Okay. Read, uh, open Luke chapter 24. You need to read the Bible. Luke 24. This is after the resurrection. Okay. Did you open your Bible? Luke 24, verse 13. Verse 13. Yeah, verse 13. That very day, this is the day of resurrection, Easter Sunday morning, okay? The final story of Gospel of Luke. Two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. They're talking about Jesus' death and resurrection. 
While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with him. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as, as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one, one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that had happened there in, uh, there in these days? He said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deeds and words before God and all the people. How our chief priests and the rulers and delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. They killed him. But we had hoped that he was the one who redeemed Israel. Yes. And besides all this, this is now the third day since this thing happened. Moreover, some women from our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning when they did not find his body. They came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Verse 24. Some of those who are with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, Jesus said to them, Oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. What's he talking about? Himself. Himself. That's an amazing statement. Slow of heart, believe all that the prophets have spoken. In other words, Old Testament was spoken about me. And how come you're so slow? I just died and resurrected and you do not believe. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Sounds like First Peter, doesn't it? Suffering and subsequent glory. And then look at verse 27. Jesus Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That's an amazing statement. You know what this verse is saying? In the entire Old Testament prophecy is about Jesus. And it was fulfilled. And it's about salvation through Jesus Christ. You should study the Bible. This is an amazing statement. Jesus himself, beginning with Moses, studying from Genesis and all the prophets, major minor prophets, he, Jesus, interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Old Testament is about Jesus. Prophecy is about Jesus. Yeah. Jesus is the end of the prophecy. Jesus is the culmination of all the prophecies. And the New Testament is about what he has taught and the salvation through Jesus Christ, written by apostles. I think we'll stop at here. I'm going to ask you to continue to read the transcripts. Be a good student, faithful student. Be a faithful student of, uh, of the word. Or else God cannot really use you. Think about it. How can God use someone who's not faithful to, uh, to, to his word? God cannot really use you. Okay? So be a good student of the word. Study uh, First Peter. Study the transcripts and try to uh, continue to learn. Any last questions? Yes, I have a question. Yes, sir. Yeah, Go ahead. You, you last one was like even the hand of the prophet. So that means there is no more prophet these days. Of course, I hear people calling themselves prophets in Uganda. Whatever, so people still call them so prophets. No more prophets and no more apostles. <laughs> there are apostles <laughs> too. There is no apostles. Apostles <laughs> are, by definition, someone who have seen Jesus as with their eye with their eyewitnesses. Mm, Death, yeah. resurrection, 
and ascension. Apostles uh, have a different sense, people who are using the apostles and prophets. Is there a prophecies? Yes, there are prophecies, but scripture needs to be on top of the prophecies because scripture has been closed. Uh -huh. Does that answer you? Yes. yes. Okay, good, good question. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Maybe the next question before you close. Sure. Um, these days, I, I I don't know because I was supposed to lead someone into salvation. or it's believed by someone, someone by himself or herself to believe in Jesus. Then he's already saved. Are we supposed to guide them in some prayers? I, I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry. It's it's big. Big. No, no, I, I hear you, but I don't understand the question. I hear you. Oh, right. yeah. What I mean is like, hmm. because in some of the churches and many places, when when they made an altar call that who wants to get saved, and then people come before the, the, the presence of the, the others, then they will begin to say, follow this prayer with me. Mm -mm. To call, speak a prayer that they will be following. So what I'm asking is, is it supposed to be a belief in someone's heart, heart that is already saved and will just leave it that way or supposed to, to follow some prayers when they pray after? There is no liturgy that saves. It's faith in Christ that saves. So I don't think it's just praying this prayer saves you, but mm -hmm. trusting in Christ in your life saves you. So it's not the mechanic of following a prayer. But uh -huh. true, by grace of God, Holy Sp through the uh, Spirit, you put mm -hmm. your trust in Him, and you begin to love Him and follow Him. That's that's that, that's salvation, not the mechanic of praying certain prayer. <laughs> okay, good question. Thank you, <laughs> brothers. My soul rejoices. I want you to know. Amen. I'm my soul really rejoices. Can you see me? I'm rejoicing. Yes. You know, I preached last Sunday about being fishers of men. Do you know joy of fishing men? I pray that you will be fishers of men. Follow me, Jesus said. I will make you fishers of men. Pastors, you need to be fishers of men. You need to share the gospel personally to people. You need to be fishers of men. Fishing takes a lot of prepar preparation. Fishing, you need to believe. Fishing, you need to love. Fishing men, I hope you love. Okay? Thank you so much. I'm going to ask Pastor Thomas to close for us in prayer. Okay, sure. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we adore you and we continue to worship you as you are our God and our Savior. Mm. We thank you for today's program. We thank you for the teachings of God's word and the teachings of God's truth, and also the learnings of God's truth. As you have uh, used your pastor mm. to teach us this time, Lord, may you strengthen him and give him more and more as he also try to raise faithful leaders who are going to preach Christ. Amen. Not to prosper the gospel. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for today. We worship you, we give you glory, and continue to strengthen us in the, in the midst of suffering. You say we all deserve to look into Jesus Christ, who is the suffering servant, mm -hmm. and we must follow him and do what he wanted us to do. Mm -hmm. We bless your name as you have blessed us for today, and even next time you'll be continuing to guide us so that we meet and we rejoice as you have given us salvation, that caused us to praise your name. Amen. Bless you, and you bless us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. Have a great yeah. evening. Yeah. Have a wonderful evening.